That's good. We mentioned, um, you know, in uh, Greek, they have several different words that they use for love, like phileo is one. That's where you get, like, Philadelphia, city of brotherly love, because phileo is brotherly love. But in English, we just use love, but I like that Rainey brought out that word compassion. Um, another word um, in English, you might hear, like in the King James Version, you hear about charity. And I love the definition that I heard once for charity. It was love in action. Uh, that it was more than just love, but it was love in action. And I, and I see compassion in a very similar way, where it's it's more than just a feeling or an idea, but there's going to be some involvement with it, some some action. So um, praise God for that. So in Genesis, we just uh, gotten to um, Noah uh, building the uh, altar and God setting his rainbow in the sky and saying he wasn't going to destroy the world again with a flood uh, we know in the new testament it talks about it as it was in the days of noah so it'll be at the end where people will be just doing their own lives marrying giving in marriage doing all these things right up until the day that noah went into the ark um, think about it right up until the day he went into the ark they're mocking um, they're they're thinking nothing's going to happen they're saying it's never rained before after even after 100 years of hearing seeing him build this thing but the very day he goes in it god closes the door and that Boom, there it is. There's the rain, there's the flood, and it's, it's too late then. Um, and so it'll be with the coming of Jesus. You know, one of the things that the New Testament talks about is the scoffers that come, saying, you know, where is the promise of his coming? Where is the promise of, of Jesus? And I was thinking about that even today, and one of the things that allows for them to have that mocking is, especially in America, we see it, where... The church really hasn't been that victorious overcoming power in the world that it should be, transforming communities and areas the way it should be by and large. Um, there are certain areas in which it does and times and places that it does, but not to the point that it should be. And so people are just like, where's the promise of his coming? Part of the coming is that Holy Spirit presence in our lives, transforming our lives, transforming our families, transforming our communities, transforming the world as we become that leaven that leavens the whole lump. And I think we are missing that a lot in America. And one of the reasons for that, there's certainly several, but one of the reasons for that is the church by and large in, a, in, a, by and large in America has allowed government to take over their work. Um, you know, feeding the hungry and taking care of those that, that are in trouble and, and all those things. And it's like all that stuff the government take. I, think about even marriage. Why, why does America have homosexual marriage? Because government took over marriage. It was never, from the beginning of time, it was always the church that dealt with marriage. It was always the religious institutions. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the ways they would sometimes prove that someone was a person was they would get their baptismal certificate as a child you know from the roman catholic tradition where they would baptize children uh you know uh or or something like that um and they would have uh, also that they got married they would go to the church to get the marriage certificate but then of course in western culture in america we let the government take over. The government started saying, okay, you're going to get a license from us. You're going to come to us. You can come to the courthouse and get married. You can do all those things. And in so many areas, we've let government take over. Um, and that's where that, that destruction's come. And so one of the scoffing that we have in this day, is one of the reasons that people are saying, where's the promise of his coming, is they're, they're not seeing the coming of Christ and the power of Christ in the body of Christ. Uh, you know, really doing transforming work. I mean, how many churches not only fight with other denominations and other Christian groups, but fight within themselves? How many churches will split and go apart and, you know, have conflict within, within their own walls? I mean, I mean, come on, happens all the time. Um, and so um, in those last days, some of those things that was happening in the time of Noah is the same things that happen now. And, and some of the things we need to counteract against and be something different be be those ones that, that are following through uh, with God another thing that we noticed last week was the difference in God's dealing with death of a human being uh, remember when Cain killed Abel he cursed the ground 
and then he put a mark on him and said don't don't mess with Cain and then later one of his descendants killed some people and started taking that curse as a blessing remember we looked at that a while back I don't know how long ago but sometime back where it was like instead of realizing that this was a curse from God he's like now if Cain was avenged 70 times I'll be avenged 77,000 times you know where, you know he's like bragging about killing these people and that hey you can't mess with me because God's gonna event and they took a, a curse which was the curse of the ground and turned it into this blessing in their life and this power and and that was just the corruption just taking over and, and of course God's grieved with all this and and he loves life. He's always loved life. The, the reason he didn't take Cain's life was because he loved life so much. But there comes a point when life can become so corrupt that you got to make a change. Uh, I have that in my garden. <laughs> the weeds have come in. I love having a garden. I love having life in the garden. But unlike Dennis's, I have lots and lots of weeds. And I basically need to go back and redo the whole thing. Get me raised beds, redo them all over. Um, they've gone too long and the weeds have gotten in and I just need to start from scratch. And it's like, I got to go cover over the ground that's there, get new ground, get it all started again and start off fresh. And that's what God did with the flood. He's like, there's so much corruption. There's so much evil. There's every thought and inclination of the heart. He's like, I'm going to start over. And remember, think about God again as a gardener and mankind in creation i mean we have god's image we're certainly something special in creation but we're also in a way this garden that he's working on this plant that he's working on it's a, it's a vine uh that he's working on so that he can get fruit the fruit is justice and righteousness um and so he takes the best that he has at this time which is noah and his family which still aren't necessarily the best of the best, right? Yeah. Amen. We see that here right after the flood, right? Noah plants a vineyard. He likes he likes grapes too. <laughs> and, and then he makes himself a little and then Noah gets a little bit drunk. And he gets drunk enough he's naked, falls passes out naked. Yeah, that's that's pretty drunk, right? How many of you are drunk? No, don't tell me. Uh, ever been that drunk? No. Uh, so he he passes out naked and uh, his one son finds them tells the others they walk in backwards so they don't cover his shame um and so he's got an is issue with drinking um and again you know because of that fermentation it's taking that blessing of god corrupting it fermenting it um god wants that choice wine that that fresh juice of the grapes that is justice and righteousness and not fermented and corrupted with all of man's things and that's just another illustration of that um, and so he takes this choice as vine which is going to be Noah and his children and he's going to plant them in an area and eventually this is going to then not too long lead to uh, Abraham or Abram who he calls out and then changes his name to Abraham and that vine he's going to plant in that specific land and it takes time right it takes hundreds of years they go into captivity all the things that happen they go and they conquer the land sort of not to the point that they should um, they, they intermix with the other groups and they constantly have this up and down and then um, in um, the prophets they talk about you know here I am I've planted this vineyard I've put it in place and yet you aren't giving me the fruit I need Jesus comes, he talks about the same thing. He's like, God planted a vineyard. He put people in charge of the vineyard. When they came to get what they were supposed to get, you persecuted them, you beat them. He was talking about the prophets. You put them to death. So God sends his son to get out of the vineyard and you kill him. And what does God do? We see it in Romans. God's going to take that vine, cut off some of the natural branches, and he's going to graft in wild branches, which is us. Yeah. Praise God. Amen. Gentiles, unless some of you are all of Jewish descent and I didn't know it. Um, you know, those of us that are not of the lineage of Abraham, now by faith we become children of Abraham. We get grafted into that vine and we can produce the fruit that we're supposed to be fruit, the, that we're supposed to be producing, that justice, that righteousness that comes from Jesus. And we can be those ones that are providing God with what he's always wanted. And praise God, now that vineyard is not just locked away in one place in one land but it's all around the world it's every kindred every nation every tribe every race every color every ethnicity and anything you can think of 
all the different languages. Praise God for that. And so um, that's what's happening here, and this is what God's doing. And again, um, he always treasured life. He's grieved with how the corruption and everything they're doing with it. So now he tells them, okay, anybody that kills a man of men, they should be killed. Any animal that kills man, because why? Because man is created in the image of God. Yeah. And when you distort, when you corrupt, when you change, when you remake the image of God in your own way or destroy the image of God in your own power and your own strength, God's not happy with that. Right? Remember the Ten Commandments. Don't have any false images, false ideas about God, false ways of making God into who you want Him to be. Yeah. And isn't that the struggle? Isn't that the reason we have so many religions in the world today? Remaking God into our own ideas, our own thoughts, our own, uh, uh, what did you say, systems and ways of doing things and saying, this is how God works. This is Him. This is... And it's just such a corruption. And it's like, God's like, no, don't mess with the image of God. Yeah, yeah. There's the, the, the line is, I mean, there's idolatry and there's adultery. Yeah. So idolatry is you like remake God in your own image. You put him in your own way. You got your own thoughts about him. You, or you have a different God. You do all these different things. But the adultery side of it is where you have something else that replaces God. Like you're talking about, you know, <laughs> you're, you're, you, it's more important to see who wins the sports game today than it is to worship God, to serve God, to, you know, and you put priorities on these other things other than God. I mean, even family um, can, can be something you put above God. There's so many things that you can put above God, um, and that's where you get into the adultery. So, um, you know, it's it's a little different than the than the image idea, but it's 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 replacing God. Yes, um, and, and the image is doing the same thing, isn't it? it it's placing our ideas, thoughts, uh, looking at God and changing him in our mind and then it can be changing him in our actions in our worship in our service um and they're they're two different things but they're really it's, it's almost like two sides of the same coin uh same thing going on so yeah uh, you're absolutely right about that um and so here he goes and he's and he's talking about you know not not killing man and and the importance and um he's gonna go on and and have this the um uh, look at verse 20 of chapter 9, uh, and then we'll get into 10. Uh, Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of the wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness, told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it across their shoulders, then they walked backwards and covered their father's nakedness. Their faces uh, were turned the other way so that they would not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done, he said, Cursed be Cain, the lowest of slaves, will be to his brothers. He also said, Best be the Lord, the God of Sham. Uh, may Canaan be a slave of Sham. May God extend the territory of Japheth. May Japheth live in the tents of Sham. And may Canaan be his slave. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. Altogether, Noah lived 950 years, and then he died. Um, so he, he got to see a lot of what happened after the flood, 350 years, right? <laughs> We don't picture necessarily a lot about that. We, we, you know, we know he's called by God. He builds this ark. We know, you know, he sends out some birds and then there's the rainbow thing and then kind of forget about Noah. He lives another 350 years. So he sees the fruit of what's happening. And uh, the, the real thing that I just want to bring out here is the fact that there is a lot of power in a father's blessings, a father's curses, um, the things a father does. Um, there's various ideas on what happened um, based on verse 24 where it says uh, he, he found out what his youngest son had done. People have put a lot of weight in had done and have made that into different things that we don't necessarily need to talk about today. But um, the fact is that Canaan becomes cursed and uh, the, the reason we just want to look at that for a second here as we go on is that later when the Israelites are coming into the land, remember one of the groups that they have a big problem with is the Canaanites. And a lot of these groups, you know, you got the Midianites, you got the Canaanites, you got the Persites, you got all these different groups. A lot of them, it's just a descendant of an individual. It's different vines that are out there. Different fruit. 
some of them are weeds some of them are productive think about jesus illustration in the new testament about the wheat and the tares god sowing wheat the enemy sowing tares they kind of look the same they're in the same area but some produce the fruit the wheat some do not harvesters coming and gathering up and burning them up and and that's what we'll see as they they go into the land and have to conquer things um and we'll get to that later um and so um verse 10 it goes into the descendants and i'm not i'm not going to look at everyone um other than to again remind you that um they don't necessarily always list every single individual that's born to them um especially a lot of times they leave out the daughters that are born but they just mentioned some of the stuff and the main reason for genealogy that that's really important in the bible the important important side of it is god showing that choice line that he's going to take god showing that um, individual that he's going to bless and the blessings that go down we understand that the sins of a father can be passed down to the third and fourth generation right you've all heard that one right Yes. I think we've all heard that. But the other side of that is blessings of a righteous man go to a thousand generations. Yes. And so the Israelites today are still experiencing the blessings of Abraham. And that's what some people struggle with. They don't realize why are they able to do so much. You got more um, Pulitzer Prize winners and, you know, all these different things as scientists and creativity and all the stuff that happens with all these descendants, riches and stuff, and people get upset about it and they think, oh, they're taken away from everybody else. They're being blessed because of Abraham. Right. Well, it's been a long time since Abraham. Well, it hasn't been a thousand generations since Abraham. So the blessings are still, and they're going to keep going. Yes. So you might as well. They include all of the <laughs> have become adopted children. Yeah, by faith, we can be children of Abraham. Yeah. Praise God. Jesus made that really clear. Um, he said, you can't just say, God can of these stones make children of Abraham. Don't just say because you're a descendant. No. If you're a child of Abraham, you'll believe in me. Jesus was talking. You believe in Jesus because he believed. Um, and that was what makes us children of Abraham. So praise God for that. So um, they go into the lineage, and then we're going to get down to, um, oh, one, one of the other things that that people have dug out of this and seen, and, and it, it certainly does make some sense, is uh, Sham, Ham, and Japheth, there is some aspect of which when you look at them, they indicate maybe a different color of skin. Um, like a darker tint and, and so forth. And that's where the different, what people call races today. We don't have races. We have one race. It's the human race. But different ethnic groups came from with the different colored skin. And of course, it makes sense because at the Tower of Babel, they get, everybody gets divided into their languages. And so um, perfectly uh, possible and legit that, that that would be where it came from is, um, you know, the, the three main fathers of what's going to come may have had a little bit different tint. Um, any of you ever have children or individuals that you've seen in families that aren't necessarily exactly as dark or light-skinned as their parents? I have seen it. But um, Anyway, um, the um, next part is the um, I guess we can just start at verse 32 of 10, and then that'll bring us into the Tower of Battle. These are the clans of Noah's sons, according to their lines of descendants within their nations, from these nations spread out over the earth after the flood. And the it says they spread out over the earth after the flood, and we're going to see how they spread out. But remember the beginning. God, when he created Adam, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Remember Cain, instead of being a wanderer and, and encouraging that filling of the earth and working with it, started building cities and people were getting more centralized and all that. We talked about that some last week. And that filling the earth thing never really was taking place, right? They really weren't going anywhere. And now they're going to all come together and they all have one language, obviously, because um, they're from one family. They're going to start building this tower so that they can deal with God, if God wants to flood the earth again, first of all, is God going to flood the earth again? What did God say? He said, never do it again. He said never again, right? Every time you see a rainbow, never again. And what's their reaction? 
let's build a tower just in case he's lying to us. Yes. We don't trust God, right? Talk about rebellion to God's word. I mean, here he speaks to their forefather, Noah, yes. and he tells them, build this ark. I'm going to send a flood. And he saves them. Oh, God's true to his word. Amen. Yes. Sets a rainbow in the sky. I'm not going to ever do this again. You don't have to worry about it. And they say, let's build a tower just in case. Wow. I mean, how fickle is that? How, how stupid is that? How... It reminds you of yourselves, you know? <laughs> remind you of us. <laughs> God said, oh, but maybe not. Maybe he, maybe. Hmm. Chapter 11. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. Uh, as man moved eastward, they found the plain of Shinar and settled there. So they said to each other, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But God came down to see the city and the tower that men were building. And God said, If as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, nothing they plan will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them uh, from there over all the earth and he stopped building the city. That is why it is called Babel because it was there the Lord confused the languages of the whole world and there the Lord scattered them over the phrase of the earth. And so, so here they come, you know, in verse 3 and following and they're like, First, they're, they're kind of traveling out, but they're traveling out as a group, and they find this plane, and they go, it's a good place. Um, let's get some bricks, make some bricks, and we'll make this big building. And uh, one of the things that, that is uh, pointed out here is that they don't want to be scattered over the face of the earth, right? And the other thing is they're going to make a name for themselves. A name among who? Who? <laughs> They're all the people that are alive. We're. I want to be rich and famous. Well, kind of everybody knows each other right now. It's not that big a group. It's, no, they're not following uh, Jesus. I, I want to stand out. Yeah. I want to. I want to make a name for myself. I want people to know my name. I want. I want to have such a name that I don't even need two names. I can just be the Donald. I don't have to be, you know. I can just be Madonna. So, I don't. I don't need two names. I only need one name. Who are you? I'm Prince. That's the spirit of pride taking over. Isn't it? Yes. Pride, arrogance, rebellion. Yes. Again, they don't want to be scattered over the face of the earth. What happens? <laughs> they get yeah. scattered over the face of the earth, yes, and all God has to do, He doesn't have to push them out all he does is he changes their languages he gives different groups probably different families different languages um that may that would make the most sense so this clan this group over here this family over here this lineage over here this vine over here he gives them a different language gives them different languages and then he just lets them do what they're going to do what do they do hey i don't understand you so i I'm going to move away from you. Right? I don't I don't know what you're saying, so I don't want to be you're weird. You got a strange accent. You don't talk right. You not be saying things the way I be saying them, so I'm going to be going some other wise. Right. You know? I mean, it's just it, all he has to do is he can find the changes the languages and they're like, they're boom. I don't want anything to do with you. Here they are all working together, having a good old time. And now they can't talk to each other, so they just whoop, spread out. What a great plan. Isn't that God wise? So smart. What's one of the things uh, we're starting to lose a distinction of now 
in the times we're in with modern technology and all these different things, we're starting to lose that division, aren't we? We're able to communicate. Even with people that speak different languages, we can communicate with them. There's, I mean, you can get apps on your phone where you speak into it and it'll speak it out and, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. You know, it's not quite to the universal translator of Star Trek. <laughs> But it's getting there. <laughs> yeah, put it in there. Yeah, um, you, you can go. You, you can pull up a web page that's in a different language, and you hit translate, and it can change it into. I mean, we're getting back now. The original beginning of the restoration of that was after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus on the day of Pentecost. You saw the disciples speaking in different languages. And the people, and or the people being able to understand them in different languages. Some people think it was in the hearing. Some people think it's in the speaking. I think the speaking, but it's fine. People have different ideas. But anyway, there was, and so there was that restoration kind of thing starting to happen with the power of the Holy Spirit and tongues and interpretation of tongues is one of those evidences of that, one of those things that, that shows it. Um, one quick testimony on that um, for people that don't understand it, um, just to, to clarify it even more. Friends of mine that are neighbors, missionaries to Africa, you've met them before, Ken and Trudy, they've been here. They were in a church service, and I believe it was in Iowa, and someone gave a message in tongues that was in Swahili. And so they understood it because they had learned Swahili in Africa, in Kenya. And the pastor gave the interpretation. Now they know, they knew those individuals, and the person that gave it didn't know Swahili. And the person that interpreted didn't know Swahili. And then um, in that, there was an individual there that had gotten away from the Lord, that gave his heart to the Lord. And then there was also uh, an understanding of another person there that they had uh, someone they knew. I don't remember if it was a relative or if it was someone they knew. I think it was a relative in another country that was serving and felt compelled to pray for them so they went and they prayed over the situation found out that he was walking down a trail that was leading to where there were some bandits and at the exact same time that they were praying there in iowa after that message in swahili he turned around didn't go down that trail they didn't find out till weeks later uh, what had happened but it was at that exact same time and that is just one of the ways of the power of god being released and used in something like that and it just so happened that they knew the language, and so they were able to understand what was said, and the interpretation was right. And, and they knew that pastor for years, and he didn't know Swahili, and even like fell down on his knees with the power of God, and normally didn't behave in that manner, but it was just such an intimate powerful time of the holy spirit moving uh and that's one of those things that was restored on the day of pentecost partially yeah. we're seeing it now partially with modern technology but there's coming a day how many of you know in heaven you're not gonna have a problem with languages yeah. right you're not gonna have a problem understanding anybody that, that, that's why we got to get rid of all bitterness and that's anger and <laughs> that's when we have that universal translator everybody who speaks everybody understands yeah praise god for that um and, and so god comes down and as he changes the languages and they they spread out and they do what he had told them to do from the very beginning spread out fill the earth and one of the reasons he's filling the earth is he's going to come he's going to take his choice vine plant it it's not going to do what it's supposed to do. And then he is going to reach out with his Savior, with the Messiah, to be that light unto the Gentiles, to bring in those from every ethnic group, every kindred, every time, tribe, every corner of the earth. And that earth that is filled is then, like that, filled with the kingdom of God. That's right. And instead of it being Jerusalem here in one place, the city of God, Israel, this nation in one place, it's the kingdom of God universal in our hearts and lives and the city of Israel where all of us are participants as we prepare for that day to go to that place where God, the city and maker, is Him. Praise God for that. Amen. What a great plan. That's right. You know, sometimes we look at the Old Testament and, and they think, well, God was so much different back then and, and, and he's different and he's like changed his mind. He's, no, this was a plan all along. Um, and that's one of the things I want to bring out as we're looking at this. That it's, he's got it figured out. <laughs> yeah. 
You're not going to catch him off guard. <laughs> he knew from the very beginning he had this planned out. He knew what he was doing. Doesn't mean it wasn't painful. When he looked and saw all that corruption, when he's interacting with that, it, I mean, that's painful. That hurts. Just like a woman in childbirth may have a plan for a family and a plan for a child, but that pain's not all that fun. It's going... But, you know, I got a goal. I'm going somewhere with it. Jesus going to the cross wasn't fun, right? I mean, he's crying out to God. He's pleading, sweats of blood, intense prayer prior to it, if it's possible. But he's going to go through that pain and suffering for the glory that's going to be revealed. Praise God for that. Amen. Um, uh, and so... I'm going to stop there, and then we will be able to hit Abraham next week and start with Abraham, because I think we covered enough. Anybody got anything you want to share? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your plan. We thank you, Lord, that you included us in that plan from before the time we were ever born, that you saw us when we were still just a seed and in Adam and uh, in Noah and, and in his children. And I thank you, Lord, that you brought us to this time, to this place, to uh, to this um, ministry that you have for each and every one of us. And I ask, Lord, that you help us to take seriously our relationship with you and the work you have for us and the place that we have in your kingdom and that we will move forth and do the things that you have called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.